elevation is such that it's minus 15 and dropping. The snow chains are not gonna work. Uh, obviously, the people who are watching on video, welcome. Uh, we wish you were here. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to go through this experience as the CB500X in this extreme territory. We're not here to do a day one, day two, day three. It's not a trip plan, right? If you'd like to get into those details, feel free to email us. Uh, and the expedition leaders, which are Explore Earth, we'll be introducing them as well. So you can go ahead and get those details from us. You know, where did we stay? Where did we stop? That's really not what this is about. It's not about the food that we ate. It's not about the accommodation. It's really about the experience and what, it's take, what it will take for you to do this type of uh, expedition on a CB500X or similar machine. My name is Sanvir Chandok. I am 32 years old, to give you the biker profile, right? 6'2", uh, 6'3", six six about 104 kgs on a good day, 105 kgs on a bad day, but need to come down to 96. That's my target weight. Uh, this is important, right? Weight is important, height is important, ground clearance is important. So we're going to get into the details. Um, I've been riding motorcycles for around three years continuously now and uh, with a hard focus on off-road and on track. So my experience has been to eventually do a ride like this. So it took about two years of training and effort and learning on a street bike, which is a CB350. Did around 5,000 kilometers on that across the Karnataka area uh, and Tamil Nadu, a little bit of Kerala as well. I really explored that on the CB350, got my chops up in terms of uh, technical riding, you know, on, on the street, and then moved on to the Africa Twin, which focused a lot on ADV training. So off-road training, trips to Zanskar, trips to Big Rock Dirt Park, uh, trail attack, as much riding time off-road in tricky terrain conditions to really get the fine tuning of the bike, how to ride at slow speeds. That's really where good expedition and adventure happens is on tough roads. And tough roads generally mean you're going slow and you have to manage the expedition, which means you have to manage yourself, manage the bike. Um, there's a whole slew of things that you need to take care of. And the first thing is your safety. So learning how to be safe on the bikes, learning how to fix the bikes, repair, maintain, uh, do roadside work, right? Uh, take care of luggage, uh, space planning, trip planning. It was about a, about a two and a half year journey of all of that until we reached this point. Uh, that's us out there in uh, short of Kaza, it's ZB500X. None of the gear has been, the bike hasn't even been washed. There's a fork oil seal that's just been leaking since the transportation. That's transportation damage. That's what could happen when you send your bike up. You need to be ready for that. You don't want to start a trip with fork oil, uh, fork seal damage, which is very, very common, especially when we're shipping um, trucks, uh, shipping bikes on trucks, right? Which is generally what we do in India. Uh, the bike is exactly as you see it is. Uh, the gear is going to be exactly how you see it is. And let's jump into it. So the plan for the evening is that we're going to start off with the challenge, the bike, the gear, the cost, the partners, and the questions. Cost is a very important thing. Uh, a lot of times we see these presentations and the cost is kind of, you know, hidden away. We want to be very transparent. What does it cost to do a trip like this? Uh, and then from there, your budget can go up or down, right? But I'm telling you a realistic cost, how much does it cost to ship a bike to Chandigarh? How much does it cost for pre-service? How much does a service like this cost when Rohit and the team take this bike in on Monday? How much is going to get cost to fix it, right? What are the actual damages that we're looking at, right? And you'll be able to see that if you do pick up a bike like this, in your ownership experience, what is it going to uh, cost you financially to do an expedition like this on your own bike? Or you may say that, look, the costs are a little too high. Let's just rent a bike out of Chandigarh. Right? So this presentation is going to help you get out there. And that's the, that's the purpose. Okay? So the challenge is to ride a vehicle from Chandigarh to Kaza. So essentially, if you see where we are, Dehradun is here. Delhi is going to be a little bit south. I'm sure all of you know Shimla, Manali, you know, the more common places. Um, Shimla, Manali, you can see on that map, you know, where they are. Um, and if you look at the ride, we're looking at 550 kilometers, 16 hours, right? That seems pretty simple. 
16 hours doesn't seem too bad. You could probably start today and finish tomorrow afternoon. The problem is that at one point, a three kilometer section took us three hours. So if you look at 550 kilometers, it doesn't sound so simple anymore. Three kilometers, so one kilometer per hour can become your speed. And when, no, no, zero traffic, no traffic, three, one kilometer per hour, right? Distance round trip, 1,100 kilometers, eight days to complete that, very, very doable. The route map generally, Chandigarh, Shimla, Kalpa, Kaza, and return on the same route. Kaza, if you take the road all the way, it reaches Manali, right? So that kind of becomes a circuit. So a lot of you would have gone to Zanskar or up north to Taramshala, you'd have taken the route up to Manali from Shimla or bypass here in this direction. That's a more common route. If you want to do Spiti Valley, it's over here, and down near Sangla Valley, right? Very, very popular place, Raksham, Chitkur. Chitkul is the last village of India before China begins, right? So these are all famous places. Kaza is a very, very famous spot in the summer, but in the winter, things die down. There's no tourism. There's absolutely no uh, guest houses that are open. There's no restaurants, nothing's going on. Temperatures at, in Kaza, a lot of the local population who run guest houses, they do live over there over winter. They store yak meat, that's the meat that they eat. Uh, there's no such veg vegetation, right? Markets are closed, so things are like, they're overwintering, right? Over a, a few months period. Uh, so there are people around, but it, they're not prepared to host tourists, right? And as we're going into these places as explorers, we're, we're tourists at the end of the day. We need to be fed, we need to have a roof on our head, we need to keep warm, uh, and they're not ready for that. So you kind of have to take everything in. Uh, and now the reason why we want to do this with an expedition team who's done this before as solo riders is that they can, they know these extreme conditions and they can help plan for that, right? So when we introduce the partners and how to do something like this uh, without, you know, with coming back with two hands and two feet, uh, you know, which is a good idea, um, it makes it easier if you have an expedition team and an expedition leader who knows what they're doing, right? So three bikes attempted the challenge, uh, one Honda CB500X and two uh, GS310s. Last year, it was three GS310 and one KTM 390, out of which uh, three bikes finished. One bike got trailered out. Um, not because of the bike, but because of the rider. Uh, too many falls on the left knee is not a good idea, right? And we'll talk about the falls. Uh, so, and one recovery vehicle, Isuzu D-Max with a trailer, with a, a team of two. So, lead mechanic and secondary mechanic, with all sorts of nuts, bolts, parts, cables, not specific to our bikes but specific to bikes in general. So the ability to do roadside repairs from them was available, but if you damage a rim, you're not gonna get a new rim out there, right? So uh, that's kind of the entire plan. So now the extremes are the temperatures and the conditions. You're dealing with minus 26 Celsius. Anyone been to minus, anyone been to zero degrees? Minus five, minus 10, minus 15. Minus 15? Minus 40. Minus, oh, okay. <laughs> but now let me ask you a question. Were you riding a motorcycle? No, no, no. I'm going to trekking. Ah, you did Chadar Trek. Okay, so Chadar Trek is in the Zanskar area. One of the most coldest climates, Arctic conditions. <laughs> the temperatures that we're talking about uh, are with wind, without wind chill. So with wind chill, you're in a little bit of a situation because as you pick up the throttle, that cold onsets faster and faster and faster. A lot of you have experienced this. It'll say five degrees out, you know, you're riding in Shimla, um, and then suddenly you feel absolutely frozen because that wind chill really picks up, especially in the shadow of the mountain. And temperatures generally are region temperatures. Specific temperatures around us, what the bike shows, what the car shows, that's legitimate. So showing minus 26 on the car with the heat around the car is probably in a negative 30 condition, and then that's in the car. But on the bike with the wind chill of say, even 10 kilometers per hour, that's going to be very, very, very cold. So that is the managing the um, managing the temperature is a major concern. The max elevation was 14,500 feet at Langza. Um, that was a, a day trip up and down. So our sleeping altitude was around 12,500 feet. So at 12,500 feet, so how many of you have crossed 5,000 feet? We're already at 3,000 in Bangalore. That's where we have great weather. 5,000 feet, I'm sure you've all been, Agumbe and uh, around Tamil Nadu, Ghat sections. 10,000 feet, Manali, right? So you've been to Manali, you've been to 10,000. 11,000, 12,000 are the areas around there. By the time we're coming up to around 14,000 feet, um, you know, every time we go higher up, what reduces? Air, oxygen. air the thinness of air, so oxygen is coming down. As we're riding motorcycles in these conditions, your body's working overtime, you're actively working, 
on the machine. So you're using up a lot of oxygen. And if you're big like me, your muscles are large. Uh, there's also a lot of fat, but your muscles are large and they, they are sucking out oxygen, right? So from your blood. So you need that amount of oxygen. So you start wheezing, breathing hard, all these things do happen. So with altitude comes this big concern of dealing with the, with the climate. And then road conditions. So on this type of ride, um, a lot of you have been off-road. You understand, okay, mud, slush, gravel, tarmac, right? Those, those are your general conditions off-road. Now with snow and ice, we're adding a lot of complexity. We're looking at dry tarmac from Chandigarh on, right? So that's fast roads. You can pretty much top out the bike at whatever speed you're comfortable with. Um, wet tarmac, because you're looking at rain conditions in areas like Shimla. Then you're looking at black ice. Overnight, that rain is going to freeze and it's going to become black ice. A lot of people have experienced black ice on a car. Your car will slide, you'll slip. Worst case situation, you may spin really bad videos on YouTube. But on a motorcycle, you, you, you're done. Like one wheel slips, you're talking about a contact patch the size of a credit card. And on motorcycles, we're just on two credit card sized pieces of rubber flying through the air at, at speed. And black ice will generally be in conditions where you've got the dry tarmac, right? So you're picking up speed. So managing black ice was extremely nerve wracking because you don't know you've hit it until you've crossed it, right? So you're kind of always ready. So your brain is working overtime. It's not a chill ride to Ladakh where you can kind of enjoy the scenery and look here, look there. You are hunting for spots on the road, where to put the tire, where not to put the tire. Um, and I have some examples of that. Mud and slush because at the end of the day, it's still, uh, you know, wild country out of Himachal. So some roads are broken, construction's happening. There's mud, the rain, normal mud and slush. Then you got snow and ice. So snow falling, the day that we were there, uh, we started the expedition, there was a five foot uh, snowfall, that, uh, three feet of snowfall that fell in Tabo and Kaza, right? So we saw a lot of snow in that area and um, the entire route was snowed in a little bit. So construction vehicles were clearing out snow as we were riding. So that became a big challenge. It was completely unexpected. We were expecting snow at a particular snow line, right? But um, with the snowfall that happened the day that we left, we got snow all along the route. So snow and ice, then we've got hard ice. Hard ice is ice that's been there in a permanent state for a long time, so over weeks or months. Then you've got churned ice. Now the hard ice, when vehicles go over it and it gets you know, mucky, it turns into this type of powder right over here. So here we can see a little bit of potential black ice. So that's going to be a red flag when we're riding. But we are in a sunny condition over here. So maybe it's melted, right? Um, but the ambient temperature when the shot was taken was minus 16. So that could pot potentially be black ice. But tarmac, and okay. No, it'll, it'll take over. Um, so then here we've got a little bit of mud, dirt road, right? General Zanskar uh, or even South India type of conditions. But then you see the wet patches, that could have ice underneath that as well. Um, then you've got this hard ice, so hard ice over here, right? Then you've got churned ice over here, and inside you've got deep snow, right? So now the, the challenge is to be able to manage all of this with one bike and with one set of gear, right? And you may encounter all of these in the same day, which did happen. And that's when the falls really increase, because we're going to talk about tire pressure, we're going to talk about snow chains, traction devices. How do you plan for this, right? Because you may encounter all this in one shot. So that was the, the big challenge. So this is what happens when you're on a ride through the day, right? So on the left, on hard ice, that's a fall of mine. And if you notice in the front, the bike is in the other lane, right? So what's happened here is, as I said, three bikes. Um, so me on the Honda, Arjun and Anu on the GSs. So that's Anu in the front who saw a car coming, where we've all heard as motorcyclists, don't look at the object, that's target fixation. You will go where your eyes look. Now the problem with ice and snow is that you have a slide problem, right? Even at five kilometers per hour, you're going to start sliding. Once you're down, you're just sliding and sliding. And on the left, you've got a cliff of uh, about two, 300 feet. So in this case, a rider in front of me, we took a turn. We hit from tarmac to white ice top, right? And Anu is out there in front and uh, he sees the car approaching. He looks at the car, panic situation a little bit, because when we're in this hard ice, the only way to ride it is to ride it on one rut. We call these ruts, which are basically like a dugout that somebody else has made. And you kind of stay on that rut as much as you can. 
Now, since we're coming off of tarmac, our tire pressures are at the tarmac range, which is around 26 psi, right, for this type of hard riding, right? We're not looking at saving our tire uh, life, we're looking at riding hard. So, we're going to drop the tire pressure down to get better grip on the tarmac. So, around 26 uh, psi. On hard ice, our preferred tire pressure would be 10 psi, right? So, we're dropping down to 10. And our speed would go from, say, 80 down to 15. So, now when you're taking a turn and you're running a tire at uh, 26 psi, you know you need to be at 10, so now, and you don't, you, don't, you don't need to drop your speed from 80 to 15, so now you're in a little bit of trouble. So, it's too much happening at the same time. So, essentially, Anu goes down, his bike crosses over the ridge, the auto is coming towards him, the auto hits the brakes, right? Thank God for that. Uh, his bike stops like six inches away from the, because they're sliding, the auto stops, they stop, everybody's okay. Now, I see this happening, and I'm like, oh God, this guy's gonna die. And what happens to me, I go down, right? I mean, I'm like 50 feet behind, and now I'm down, I'm sliding, right? Now my bike's going. Luckily, it slid only like 10, 15 feet in a straight line, uh, and then came to a stop, right? And uh, that's that. Okay, how does ABS work on ice? Uh, basically, ABS has a minimum speed that it engages at. Generally, when you're on ice, you're below that minimum speed. And uh, you don't want to trust ABS to save you, because the traction limit is like so, so close, one slip and you're kind of done, right? You will lose the front. So front brake is absolutely no option, right? So it's only rear brake, right? Because if you lock the rear, you may be able to slide. What happens is that the tail of the bike swings around really quickly. So what you need to do is put your feet down. When you put your feet down, you've, you're wearing rubber boots, right? And those rubber boots, those rubber boots don't, uh, don't really fare too well on ice, right? So this, this rubber boot contacts ice, it's gonna slip. So we put a crampon at the bottom, uh, ideally. Now the problem is you're coming from wet tarmac, uh, dry tarmac onto ice. So we're already wearing tarmac, we're ready for tarmac. We need this boot to stop on the road. So when you have an ice condition like this, not falling is uh, the best outcome you can expect, you're probably gonna fall, right? So you need to be ready for that mentally and uh, physically, right? So uh, you're coming on with a road boot, Putting that on ice, even if you put your leg down and try to catch the slide, you're gonna slip and you'll probably hurt yourself more because you'll do a split. Um, so that's the reality, right? That's the difficulties of, of this condition and terrain, right? So on the right side, here we're at night. Now the problem with the dark, nobody ever plans to ride in the dark, but I'm sure every single one of us has ridden in the dark. Every ride is supposed to stop at five. That's what everyone's told us. And every single rider has ridden uh, beyond five, right? So whatever you plan, now, now at night, you can't see anything. Your headlights, which are white color, are bouncing off the ice, right? So you, you're blinded by your own headlight. So you try to wear a yellow filter, which is why we change the lens in the goggle co continuously. So in the daytime, that's a daytime lens, because sunlight is bouncing off the ice, right into your eyes, so you wanna turn that out. Uh, then you are at night. At night, you wanna hit, so between dusk, you want to go with like a clear lens, because your headlight is not on yet. Then at night, you want to go with a yellow lens uh, or a yellow beam of light, right? So that it's not bouncing and hitting your own eyes. You can actually see where you're going. And then on the bottom here is your general condition through the ride. There's on the ground, on your ass, and you know, you're just happy that nothing's broken. This is Arjuna the 310, right? And this is how fast things happen. It's on. So all you're looking at over here is this patch and everybody's seen a patch of water, right, in, in front. The problem is that underneath that is just solid ice. Right, so that, that's that situation. All right, cold starting the CB500X. After it dealt with minus 20 plus degrees. Let's see how it performs. Take a second, I'll do mine. All right. One shot. One shot, baby. <laughs> Okay, so one button, the bike's on, that's Honda right there for you. Minus 26 degrees overnight, like the bike is absolutely frozen. And one shot, you're done. Now we'll see how the BMW performs. Now the GS is. <laughs> oh, straight onto the Honda Gram. Okay, very nice.
Now, uh, another concern is when we talk about traction and traction devices, right? So we've got tires, that's giving us traction. Tires on the road, we spoke about 26 PSI. On ice, 10 PSI. Uh, with my body weight, 11 to 12 was a better option. Um, the other option is to put snow chains. Now, you can put a snow chain on the rear, you can put, put a snow chain on the front. So rear snow chain only. Now, every time you put snow chains on, you have to take them off. Every time you put them on, you're in the cold at minus 20, minus 15. Things are not very comfortable. So you want to minimize the amount of time you're spending not riding. That's how you do three kilometers in three hours, right? Uh, so you may put rear snow chains on only. See how it goes. Maybe lose the front end a few times. Maybe have a fall and say, okay. Or maybe you'll be going down and say, okay, now let's put a snow chain on the front, right? So these are all tools that you've got. Right in, at your disposal, you can't throw everything at the same time because when you have your snow chains on, you can't ride on tarmac. You can't do more than 10, 20 maybe. Um, if you're doing a front snow chain, you have to take off the front mud guard on most bikes. This bike was able to handle it with the front mud guard on. If you're doing rear chains, which we were expecting, we removed the chain protector. Right, there's no chain protector on the bike uh, because we're expecting to do rear chain. So every single decision has a trade-off in terms of traction. Uh, so in this case, we're doing a roadside uh, switch of a tire. Uh, to put grip sided tires on, on the BMW. We had one set of grip sided tires, take an old tire, old rim, drill holes in all the knobbies, and then screw in uh, pretty much spikes, like you've got your running cleats, that onto the, onto the tire. So, this is what a roadside repair could look like. Uh, the problem with black ice is that it's on tarmac. And you can't ride a snow chain more than about 15 to 20 kilometers per hour on tarmac. So if you are just going to be doing the whole ride at 15 kilometers per hour with snow chains on, you're probably going to break the chain, first of all, on the tarmac. And then the black eye expectation is too, it's, it's more of a concern than a reality. You're always concerned and maybe once in a day you may hit black eyes. But every time you could be hitting black eyes. So, but you're on tarmac. So the thing is that snow chains on black eyes would help, but then you'd have to stop every time. It wouldn't be if you... Okay, now here's no snow chains, uh, tire pressure at around 28, 30. This is the first introduction to ice. So you, what you'll notice is the speed and notice how the riders are very, very, very cautious. We're taking a slightly uphill turn. That's what three hours for three kilometers looks like, right? So feet on the ground, there's no cleat on the boot. There's, we've come off the highway, climbing the mountain, the sun's going down. Temperatures are dropping significantly. We have no idea what's ahead of us. We were actually, there were other cars, they were all behind us. So they hadn't done the route to, to radio in and tell us, hey, you got ice, put snow chains on, right? If you have a car in front of you, they can kind of tell you, you got about five kilometers of ice, put the, put the snow chains on because for five kilometers, it's worth it. In this case, we don't know what's after the next bend. We don't know how serious it's gonna get. So we're kind of keeping things uh, at a low traction then slightly adding 111 device because every time you add a device on, you're trading off a lot of other stuff as well. That's the cold and the sniffers and everything and you're so tired because you're going so slow and you need to keep balanced absolutely perfect at like two kilometers per hour, right? One wrong turn left or right of the front, two inches on the right, you may be looking at, you know, putting your leg down. Every time your leg goes down, that's a hard impact. Then you've got to kick yourself back up, stabilize the bike. So it's a very, very slow process. And since we're going downhill now, a trick that's happening over here, if you notice, there's no engine noise. The engine is switched off. The engine is completely switched off. What's happening over here is that you've seen a downhill, you know there's a lot of ice coming. Switch off the engine, use the clutch to engine brake. Right, use the clutch with the engine off, but the engine is flicked back on with, the, with my finger ready on the starter, right? I'm ready, so that's turned on, so as soon as I press the button, the, it will fire back up just in case I need some traction to pull out. Now this is a very interesting trick, it's the first time I ever tried it. The advantage here is that you can use the clutch as a brake, right? So I'm using the clutch and the gears are kind of stopping the bike without having to press the rear brake. But the problem is that if you let go of the entire clutch, it'll slide again, because it's gonna lock up all the gears, right? So I'm in first gear, uh, coming down, engine off, using the clutch, modulating out, just feeling, okay, that pressure's coming in, and then touching the rear brake, tapping, 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 just to keep, because you, the speed can increase very fast. You're going downhill at five, then 10, 15, 20, you're done. There's no stopping that bike, right? And again, we don't know what's around the bend. Luckily, in this case, there is a railing on the left, so worst case, you'll hit that, but you could easily slide underneath, right? So um, that's the difficulty of the situation. 
Now here's what happens with snow chains, uh, and you'll see. So this music is from my helmet. So this is my music that I'm listening to at the time. <laughs> that's it. I mean, there's nothing. I mean, that's literally it. So we're just gonna watch. Everything looks okay. The, the boys are up front, you know, we're all coming in slowly. Yeah. So now if you notice, I'm trying to figure out, so I'm double thumbs up, you know, everything is okay. So I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Bikes on the ground, first thing you do, switch it off, right? Your bike goes down, switch off the bike, right? A lot of bikes will have an auto switch off, right? But if your bike doesn't have an auto switch off, first thing you do is switch off the bike and chill for a second. Right now, I'm just kind of testing to see like, am I on a downhill, uphill, like will the bike move? Like, you know, can I lift it up by myself? Trying to do checking traction on the rear, can I lift it from the back? It's all snowy and icy and now I notice something. Right, so this is uh, talking to Arjun up front. He's waiting, so I'm gonna wait for him to come, the third biker's here, and I'm pointing at him and saying, hey, look at that patch over there. There's something there, avoid it. Right, so he's coming through, you can see the snow chain on the front, mudguard removed. He's, and you can't see this, right? Has anyone spotted it yet? It's a small pothole type thing. Not a pothole. Black ice. Not black ice. Right, so you see the oil. cleats, not oil. You will be very surprised, but when you, you'll be like, oh, obviously, <laughs> every road has this, but uh, you'll never know. It's the night light, oh, the, cat the, the cat eyes, oh my God. right, it's the cat eye. Now the cat eye is solid metal and there's no way of seeing that. Okay. So you're just riding along, happy listening to your music, enjoying it and boom, you're gone, right? So you need to be ready. Uh, so the cat eyes and they're removed from the ground, I don't know why, they were just lying there. So that's how quick things can happen, yes. right? Everything, and this is, if you notice, it's the end of the entire ice section, the snow chains are on, I've made it without falling. It's a hairpin bench, so we're all stopped to look at the hairpin, what angle do we take it at, and then me looking at Arjun, it's gone, right? So now, that's a little bit of the conditions, right? Uh, now let's move on to the bike really quickly.